Jay Suit Chum, my guest tonight, is one of our leading Cantonese operatic divas, or Fa Dan. She's been at the height of her profession for many years and has increasingly come to be seen as an ambassadress for Cantonese opera in Hong Kong. <laughs> Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Iron Hong Kong. Our subject this evening is Cantonese opera. Now since its heyday in the 20s and 30s, the art form has experienced something of a decline, until that is about four or five years ago, when its fortunes revived. I confess to you that this is not my most familiar of subjects, so to help me through it, I've invited into the studio leading local performer, Chase Yu Shum. Welcome to the studio, Shum. Thank you for coming. Thank you. It is my pleasure to meet the audience in TVB Pearl. How very nicely put. I'll be talking to Shum in more detail later, but first, some background information. To many a Westerner, and for that matter, to many a Chinese one too, more used to the soothing blandishments of canto pop, the world of canto op, or Cantonese opera, is a difficult and inaccessible one. The key, of course, to its understanding is education. And to that end, I've come along to the Sam Tang Up Museum here in Chern Wan to take a look at an exhibition entitled A Century of Cantonese Opera. One of the first things I learned was that Cantonese opera hasn't always been performed in theatres. In the last century, the only time peasants in some remote villages would have seen opera performed was when a boat rather like this passed. It served as both the troupe's home and its stage. Whereas nowadays it's canto pop stars like Leslie Cheung on the posters, between the wars it was canto op stars. The largest and most impressive of the displays here is the one devoted to the costumes, a feature of Canto Op guaranteed to appeal to even the most tone-deaf barbarian. And if the form doesn't allow electric guitars, it does allow electric clothes. These headdresses are of 1930s vintage, by which time the earlier, rather crude cosmetic techniques of Cantonese opera had been influenced by such diverse forces as Beijing opera and Hollywood. There's also a strong Hollywood element in the makeup on display. I'm sure I saw this chap in Nightmare on Elm Street. These examples come from a manuscript of the late 19th century, but the characters represented are still portrayed on stage to this day. One thing that has changed significantly down the years is the art of writing libretti. Although today everything is tightly scripted, in the past little more than a basic plot outline was supplied to the performers. They were expected to improvise as best they could. Indeed, the ability to improvise was as highly regarded a quality as the performer's voice itself. I learned a lot from this exhibition, but there was just one note which slightly grated, or rather didn't. There was no opera being played at all. An easy introduction, I suppose. You can see that exhibition presented by the Regional Council at the Sam Tang Up Museum in Chernwa. In operas, early days, although music was written, the verbs usually were not. But libretto writing went on to become a highly refined art in itself. However, by the 1960s, it had very nearly died out altogether. I spoke with Mr. Poon Shan. He's one of Hong Kong's few working librettists about the reasons for that decline. Poon Shan explained that the great stars of the time when Cantonese opera's popularity was at its height had either died or retired, and that today's performers simply weren't well enough known. While he didn't see a return to the days of crowds outside the Lee Theatre, he did express confidence in the future. Where there are Cantonese people, there will be Cantonese opera, he said, and pointed out that travelling troops perform almost every day somewhere in the territory. And moreover, the Urban Council was now lending invaluable support. <laughs> Apart from the words and the music, the other essential elements of the spectacle of opera are, of course, the costumes and the makeup, which in the golden years between the wars became ever more extravagant and adventurous.
做粵劇，貪靚係其中一個原因。粵劇佢包含所有嘅舞台劇嘅長處咧，仲多。In the cramped workshop in Mong Kok, where Chen Kok Yun lives and works with his two assistants, he explained that the costumes themselves serve to convey the characters' personalities and attributes. In answer to my query as to whether he had difficulty persuading young people to enter the profession, Chen admitted that this was the case. He thought that the sheer complexity of the work deterred them. Why, I wonder, did he take it up? Because I am a person who is very interested in doing this work. Because of the life and the world, the past is just a little bit more than the past. So now, it is all for the purpose of doing this work. Even my friends and my friends are also interested in doing this work. In the past, an eight-year apprenticeship had to be served before an artist was deemed ready for a public performance. These days, though, things are not easier thanks to the Urban Council. They provide training, sponsorship and also arrange performances where young hopefuls can display their potential. Their support has been vital to opera's revival. Our guest reporter Anne-Marie Gutierrez attended a class at the Ran Man Chinese Opera Institute. Here's her report. There are actually many amateur Chinese opera troupes here in Hong Kong, like the Wan Man Opera Singing Institute that I visited. The recent surge of interest in Chinese opera may be reawakened by the yearning of the younger generation to search for their roots, part of which is encompassed in the historical backdrop and revealing lyrics of Chinese opera. Another reason may be the relatively greater financial independence of today's youth. This interest in Chinese opera is further propelled by the stimulating involvement of the Urban Council and the intellectual institutions, like the two universities. However, very few of the enthusiastic young ones, no matter how hard they try, can reach a certain professional level. The two teachers of the Wan Man Institute, Ms. Lei Fan Fang and Ms. Lo Wan Yin, tell us some of the reasons why. Because the charms of Chinese opera all seem to simply and fluidly flow on stage. Yet hours or even years of strenuous exercise and training are integrated into putting up a good show. We also explored the issue of the reluctance of the masters of the former generation to pass on the tricks of the trade to the younger ones. Veteran Chinese opera trainer Ms. Zhang Yuk Lui Explain the dynamics behind this for us. 我睇咧就係由於即係以前嗰個社會關係啊，啊啲封建社會關係咧，有句話就咧，誒教曉徒弟就冇師傅，咁所以形成咧即係我教咗啲藝術俾你啦，形成就覺得我自己咧誒。即係誒低咗啦，或者係影響嗰個誒做戲嗰個誒質量啊咁，即係師徒弟叻過我啦，咁啊驚即係俾人叻咗唔得威咯，咁所以佢呢種社會嗰個造成嘅，但係到我得到而家咧，唔應該有咁睇法咯。而家社會進進步咗啦，應該係我覺得誒，我哋不遺餘力咁樣去去培養一啲新嘅誒新手出嚟。誒第一個原因咧就係我自己本人嘅興趣啦，第二個原因咧主要咧我就係想 keep fit。咁啊，希望咧，我哋嘅粵劇咧要不停嘅改進。
咁咪使到粵劇派陽光大。Now we welcome into the studio an old friend of the program. Yes, it's City Beats John Loudon. Welcome, John. Thanks for coming in. Now you're one of the very few Guai Lo who actually enjoys Cantonese opera, I believe. Explain yourself. Well, like everyone else, I like what I see. Visually, it's great, and there's a lot of action. Secondly, I really appreciate the challenge in singing Cantonese opera. One time, I tried myself to sing Cantonese opera, and <laughs> wow, it's easy to sing pop. I mean, anyone, a baby can sing pop compared to singing Cantonese opera. Well, how did it come about that you ended up singing Cantonese opera? Well, um, enjoy yourself tonight. The TV program on the Chinese channel. They um, invited us to come and sing a Cantonese opera song with a Chinese singer, one who sings a lot of folkish kind of Cantonese songs. And uh, they gave us the two songs, says make a medley of these, rock style. Rock style, Pop not style. traditional. Then. No, kind of Pink Floyd style. <laughs> Turned up. <laughs> it blows the mind. It's yeah, the very prospect of it. Well, how is how easy is it to to set um, something like Chinese music in general to to Western pop rhythms because it's a different tonal mm -hmm. scale for a start, isn't it? Well, there's sections of Cantonese opera that um, aren't too hard to set to a um, Western kind of uh, music. In the, well, there's one thing it doesn't do that pop does is that it doesn't really repeat itself. It keeps going all over the place because it's almost like a whole story unfolding. And so that's the only thing that's different. You know, it's not a, you don't hear the same chorus over and over again. But you can set it to music, to Western music, quite easily. Thank you very much, John. Now we'll have more on the future of Cantonese opera with leading local opera troupe Chou Feng Ming after this. In Chinese opera, they, do, they did a lot of live shows. Not only the costume is interesting and the makeup, but in fact, the, the feeling which they develop and, and deliver, how to express to the, the audience. For example, you know, if they want to tell something or think about something, they use their eyes a lot, you know. For example, their hand, it always goes together with the eyes. It, go, when it goes this way and then it goes like that. And when they are thinking, they goes like that, you know, you can tell the feeling and the, the concept and uh, arts is there. A lot of people say that Chinese opera is so noisy, uh, um, they don't understand what sort of music is there. But actually it's not a noise, you know. When they, when they make every move, every movement which they make, it goes together with the music. 